I've just finished making this display box for this ring. And it's not as complicated as it might appear at first. And so I'll go over some of the techniques used to make a box like this in this video. If you're more interested in the narrative about this specific box, then I would invite you to visit my second channel. And I'll put a link in the description. Okay, so in this video there will be three points of focus. The first will be how we can make an apparatus that will enable us to make box joints with a dado stack. The second thing that I'll talk about is how to make a dado stack without actually buying a dado stack. And the third thing that I'll discuss is how to make box joint like boxes without even using a dado stack. My box joint method is not offering you much in the way of originality, but I am making an attempt at simplicity here. The premise behind the way it operates is still using the same key and groove method. The only difference between mine and many of the other things that you might see out there is that I'm using a dedicated sled. There's a very simple reason why I prefer a sled to just clamping a faceplate like this onto a miter gauge, and that's because of this, these irregularities in the saw table. When you use a sled, it's a much more smooth surface to work on, and you don't have to ride over all of those bumps. Take notice that this faceplate could be exchanged for a different one, and I'll explain why in the next part. But also take notice that I have it marked with a 3 along with the corresponding key. <sighs> Alright, the dado blade. If you're anything like everybody else, you've picked up one of those dado blades at the store and thought, why on earth is it so expensive? I don't want to pay that. Can't I just stack blades on top of one another? And I've given this considerable thought, and I've decided that, yes, you can. And I'm going to tell you how. However, I want you to listen carefully first. There is a reason that nobody wants to address this point, and that's because of liability. Nobody wants to recommend that you can do this or that it's easy for fear that somebody might cut their face off. Well, I'll show you a way that I think that you can do it reasonably safe, safely. That being said, you still shouldn't do this. This video is strictly for entertainment. First, I want to talk about blade types for a moment. Yeah, I know it's boring, but you need to know this. Imagine that we could zoom in on these little carbide teeth, and you'd see on most blades, at least the ones that I use, you'll see a, a tooth that points to the left and a tooth that points to the right. This is called an alternating top bevel blade. Now, some blades have flat top blades as well, and these are called combinations. Now, as you've probably already figured out for yourself, a blade that has these flat top carbides on it is the blade that's the best suited for making box joints because it's going to make the flattest cut. So technically I'm using the wrong type of blade for this, but because it's a thin kerf blade, the end result is a cut that's so fine that it's hardly even noticeable. Okay, so I've established that this procedure can be done and it can be done safely. That doesn't mean that you should go and mock and laugh at this, all of the harbingers of safety because they have a good point. There are legitimate concerns with doing this. You can't just slap two, three, or four blades on top of one another and expect good results. There are serious safety considerations. For one, the blades, if they should rotate, if the carbide tips collide with one another, they could eject pieces of carbide, which is ridiculously hard. And if you know anything about material science, the fastest way to break one hard object 
is with another object that's equally hard. Uh, if you two hard ceramic pots can chip if they contact one another, and so we need to prevent that from happening in this case. And what is my secret? Oh, you're gonna kick yourself. Bicycle tube rubber. You want to cut a circle that's just short of these little uh, vibration slash expansion laser etchings, and then you are free to make a saw blade sandwich. It's very important that you keep the rubber spotless clean. I didn't do that here. I'm going to clean it before I show the demonstration. And the reason for that is because when it's pressed on the arbor, the rubber is going to compress uniformly and make a suction cup like seal that bonds each blade to the next. You can expect that this won't move at all, even after a couple hours of use. I, it's also worth mentioning that I'm going to arrange the teeth into this brick-like formation, so you can see two, one, two, one, two, one. The orientation of the blade, or the carbide teeth types, well, I'll leave that up to you and to experimentation. As I've already mentioned, this is from a bike inner tube. And I took some measurements just to see, and it seems to average about 0 0.0375 inches. If you only speak metric, you're gonna have to learn to convert. Now I suppose before we proceed, we should have a problem that box joints can solve. And make no mistake about it, this is a problem. Every time I shut this drawer, the Forstner bits creep a little bit more towards the back. So I would like a box that fills up this cavity in the back, and a smaller box that fills up this little front cavity. I will use regular box joints for that, and I will use the box joint without a dado stack trick for this little box here. I'm using this homemade table saw to rip my stock, because it's nice to just leave the dado stack in the other saw alone once it's been set up. I'm giving this insert a loose fit so that later on I can take it in and out of the drawer easily if I want to. I think I'll just dry fit it all together without using glue for the purpose of this video. But if you would like to see how I will eventually add petitions to it later on, then check in on my other channel. I put some more in-depth stuff there. Sorry about all the self-promotion. To get really perfect box joints, you have to pay attention to the details. But once everything's in place, the process is really quite easy. Every piece is the same, one side goes against the key and the flip side goes against the spacer key. This is a case where you should try not to think about it too hard while you're doing it. Later on, you can look at your finished box and stare at it all you want. In case you didn't realize it yet, the number 3 represents the number of blades that I'm using. A blade could be added or subtracted to vary the thickness of the box joints. There is an alternative to what I've just done here. 
if you want to make a little container that still has the look and strength of box joints, but without having to use a dado stack at all, then just measure your dimensions and simply reduce by how thick your stock is. Cut all four sides of your box this way. Just measure and reduce by the thickness of the material. Then we rip each of these sides into little strips, which, when we put them together, will form the basis for our joinery. Masking tape might be put to good use here, especially if you don't like doing glue-ups. As per usual, things got a little bit hectic during the glue up. If you are going to use clamps, you have to clamp it here on the edge with these blocks. I just didn't, I didn't think about it enough and I just clamped it right in the middle and it just kind of went like this. Think about it. Now I only allowed it to be clamped for about five minutes. And then I released it, put weight on the top and squared it up. Okay, here it is after a little bit of a sanding, nothing too fancy, and I'm definitely pleased with it. This stack of plates has not been off since before I started filming this video, and I want to show you what happens. They stick. In fact, you have to be careful not to bend your blade. So, as you can see, we're in very little danger of the blades slipping. I hope you found this video useful. See you guys. Problem solved.